our lesson today is simple stress. Notice the word simple. We're doing it slightly different to the book because uh, the book does stress and elasticity together in just tension. But we're going to do the two stresses, which is the tension and the shear. And then we're going to do elasticity and tension and shear. Second. But we're going to go back over some of our basic word definitions first. Make sure we have them down straight. Density is mass per unit volume. Watch out for the units. The mass is in kilograms. The volume in cubic metres, not in litres, in cubic metres. Uh, so that means the units for mass uh, is kilograms. Volume is uh, cubic meters, so density is kilograms per cubic meter. So steel has a density of around 7,800 kilograms for a cubic meter of steel. So about almost eight tons for a meter by meter by meter block of steel. So our strength, the word strength we use uh, is a measure of stress. And stress, first of all, is newtons per square millimeter. Why do we use millimetres when we're supposed to be using metres all the time? Well, engineers cheat. And one of the cheats is, when we ever we do stress, the pascal, which is a newton per square metre, is way too small. All right, we can't even, you know, we, we're going to be measuring in millions of pascals, at least thousands of pascals. So we'll tend to use kilopascals and megapascals all the time. Well, when we're dealing with stress, which is uh, forces and um, areas, uh, when we're calculating stress in metals and plastics, we're going to be working in the hundreds of megapascals, so we're definitely going to go straight to the megapascal. So, in order to get megapascals, if we use newtons per square millimetre instead of per square metre, that is a megapascal, because there's a thousand by a thousand millimetres in a square metre. A thousand times a thousand is a million. So that's why millimetres will give you mega, million, megapascals. For example, steel is about 400 megapascals, typically. Really strong steel could be a thousand megapascals. All right, so this is the one we're going to be mostly talking about today. We're talking about simple stress, and we're going to deal with this formula uh, all the way through. Um, there's a couple of other words which um, always need to be reminded. Make sure you have these nice and clear. Hardness, resistance to indentation and abrasion. Stiffness is how much stress it takes to stretch it by a certain proportion. Toughness is how much energy it takes to break. Um, elasticity is the ability to return to the original um, dimension when you, when you let go of stress. And plasticity is the opposite, the ability to stay bent or deformed after you let go. <coughs> so these, these ones, you, I'm always going to bring these up because you need to know them um, very clearly. This, this table is just highlighting the different types of stress and we're going to be going through uh, different questions based on these stresses. But the most important thing is that there's only three types of stress. There's tensile stress, compressive stress, and shear stress. That's it. All the other types, like torsion and bending, are combinations of those. But you can only either pull something, or squash something, or slide something. And that's it. Now the best way to think about this is to imagine it in an atomic scale. So let me draw a an atomic lattice. These are my atoms. Now if I'm pulling on those atoms, these atoms are actually sort of stuck together. It's kind of like they've got springs in between them. And that's the atomic attraction between each of the atoms. So imagine it's kind of like a, a big network of little blobs with springs in between. And don't forget this is three dimensional as well, it also comes out from the page. If they've all got springs in between, if I pull on those, then these springs here are going to be stretched a bit, and so that when I let go, the springs will bring, bring it back. So that's elastic. So every time I stretch them, when I let go, the springs bring it all back to where it was to start with. The same happens when I do compression. If I try to push those together, those springs are now getting too close. Those atoms don't want to be that close, and so when I let go, they're going to spring back to where they were to start with. All right, so this is elastic we can either stretch the atoms apart, which is called tension or tensile stress, or we can squash the atoms from their natural position, which is compression, uh, producing compressive stress. The other type of stress is shear, and that is when you're trying to attempt to slide the atoms past each other, and if the shear increases 
too high, then you get slip, which is where the atoms have now permanently changed their position to a new position at some location in that metal grain or crystal. Like this, let's say we've got these two along there, and this one started off here, but I, I keep pushing it until it gets to about here, then the connection that it used to have to there is now stretched so much that it's actually closer to this one. And so what can happen is this connection can flip and go to this one instead. And it's decided, oh, forget it, I'm gonna go to the next, one, next atom. When that happens, that's called slip. And uh, shear is the easiest way to understand uh, slip because I'm trying to push these atoms across. I've pushed them so far that they would actually prefer to click to the next atom. And as soon as it does that, as soon as that connection now is joined to the next atom, when I let go, it's not uh, elastic anymore, it's permanent. So these stretching and pulling of the um, atom's attraction is elastic, but if I take it too far so that that attraction switches to another atom, which is called slip, that's plastic. Elastic bounces back to the original, but the plastic one is permanent. An example of mild steel, and mild steel, when you first pull on it, is elastic. So I can take it up to this stress, maybe it's about uh, 200 megapascals. And if I let go again, I'm back to where I started. So if I went back onto this diagram, I'm stretching the atoms, and when I let go, they, they pull back to the original position, elastic. But if I take it too far, there's a certain point, if I go beyond that point, which is called the yield point, then what, what's happening is these atoms are starting to click over. They're clicking into new positions. Uh, the mechanism is slip and the behaviour is plastic. So this is what's happening with mild steel. It's elastic up to here. Once I go past this elastic limit, which is called the yield point, then now it's doing plastic deformation, which is rearranging the atoms into new positions. Uh, and that keeps happening until finally uh, it can't take it anymore. And that's the ultimate tensile stress, the highest you can get. And then it fractures after that. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that because I'll just, I'll just lead you into what, what actually happens in tension because you can imagine in shear that these would click to the next one, that's fairly logical. But uh, in tension what actually happens is while you're pulling on these you can end up with this row of atoms and that row of atoms sliding. So this thing actually does a kick that way at 45 degrees. So 45 degree failures in, uh, in tension are an example of ductile failure. Anyway, we're going to get into more details about uh, all slip and atoms and stuff in the material subject. We're more interested in the calculations in this subject. Our first uh, formula is the formula for stress. And before we even begin that, I have to uh, make a clarification between the book and the rest of the world. With, with the book we're using, Ivanov, um, our symbol for stress is F. Um, stress. Stress or something. I don't know how to pronounce for stress, but anyway, I've got absolutely no idea why it's an F, nor does anyone else, it seems. So um, the rest of the world uses this, uh, this letter here. Sigma is the Greek letter for uh, S, lowercase. Uh, so uh, it's so common, it's universal, it's so common that sometimes they even call stress sigma. So on uh, Inventor, when you're calculating stress in a, in a material and you've got stresses in the X direction, Y direction, Z, they'll call it sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, instead of calling it stress. So it's, uh, everyone calls stress sigma. <coughs> so get used to it. Even though it's not in the textbook, I will use it. I'm going to use both of them so that you can read the textbook and uh, the rest of the world. But most of the time when you're on the internet, uh, you'll see this one, sigma. The other two are okay. We've got force F for force and A for area. <coughs> and like I said, we use millimetres. Now, um, as far as the definition for stress, there is only one other thing you need to watch out for, and that is that the definition of stress is that things have to pull apart. So back into here again, if I'm pulling on these atoms, I'm stretching these atomic uh, attractions between uh, t uh, two rows of atoms. So you're going to break something if the 
uh, atoms are pulled apart until they break. <coughs> so that means the definition of stress is you have to have a force up and a force down, or you have to have two opposing forces. So uh, a, a big trap for beginners is to go, oh, we've got 100 newtons that way and 100 newtons that way, so therefore the force must be 200 newtons. Wrong. All right, the definition of stress is there's one there and one there. If you only have one, you're not going to get any stress. The thing's going to accelerate. Okay, so by definition, stress is one's pulling that way and the same's pulling that way. Therefore, that's the stress between the two layers of atoms. <coughs> so never ever double your stress just because there's two forces there. Simple examples. <coughs> we have something of diameter 12 millimeters and, this, and the force is 14.7. So... Uh, Fourteen point seven kilonewtons is pulling on both sides, and the cross section of this is twelve millimeters diameter. Okay, we're trying to calculate the amount of stress, so we have to work out what is the area that the stress is applied over, and what is the force. So force is fourteen point seven kilonewtons, so that's fourteen thousand seven hundred newtons, and the area is pi r squared, which is the same as pi d squared over 4. Same thing, because um, that's in 12. So we could do pi times 6 squared, or we could do pi times 12 squared divided by 4. So that's pi times 6 squared, or 36 pi. <coughs> Alright, so when we put those numbers in, stress is force over area, 14,700, and the, that's the force, and the area is um, 36 pi. Put that in your calculator, you get about 130, 130 is the answer. Now what are the units? Newtons per square millimeter, and newtons per square millimeter is megapascals, so that's 130 megapascals. So that would be the question. Okay, if, if I do have that much force and it's 12 millimetre diameter, can, can steel handle that amount of stress? And we look at 130 megapascals and we say, yeah, steel should be fine for 130 megapascals. So therefore, we can make it out of steel. But if we made it out of a piece of plastic, we might be worried because 130 megapascals is pushing it for plastic. <coughs> Unless, yeah, carbon fibre, you handle it. Right, this one's uh, asking the question around the other way. We've got um, something, some copper wire, and it was holding 264 newtons. Uh, how thick does the copper wire have to be uh, in order to handle that amount of force? And so this time we're working around backwards, and we have to go and look up the uh, strength of copper, and it says the ultimate tensile strength is 415 megapascals. <clears throat> so this time we're working backwards, we're saying we want to find out what the area should be, so it broke at 264, so let's have a look at the formula again, stress, stress equals force over area, we know the stress, 415, we know the force, 264, we're trying to find area, so rearrange this formula, put area over here, area equals force divided by stress, and force is 264. Stress that it can handle is 415. So that gives us an area of 0 0.6 square millimetres. Now we can get from that the diameter. So it's just like a piece of wire. <coughs> from pi r squared, the radius is 0 0.2, so uh, squared is 0 0.2, so the actual radius is, is about 0 0.45. Just a little under half a millimetre in copper. That's the radius, so the diameter will be almost a millimetre. So these questions can be asked forwards, backwards, working out areas, working out stresses, or working out uh, forces. <coughs> Alright, that's this is the third way we can do it. This time we've got our diameter, we've got our load, and we're trying to work out um, how much force 
it will take to break it. So you switch the formula around, work out force equals stress times area, and you get 700 newtons. All right, simple formula. We can ask any of those types of questions. Now, the same, exactly the same, everything here has been tensioned. The exactly the same thing happens in compression. So the, there's no change in the formula at all. It doesn't matter if you're pulling it or squashing it. You're still going to go force over area, which is the area of cross-section, cross-sectional area. That's tension, that one. In compression, everything will be exactly the same. So, for example, we might do a compression test on, um, on a concrete specimen. Let's see what we've got in here. There we go. We're doing a compression test here. We've got concrete, the diameter is 150 millimetres, and it handles that amount of force, how much stress was applied. Now, um, they make concrete cylinders. They're about 100 mil diameter, usually about 300 mils long. And when they're pouring a uh, concrete, they want to double check that that concrete's okay. So uh, they make some specimens of, for testing the concrete. <coughs> um, it's usually a requirement if it's been specified to, to do the test. And when they're doing the pour, uh, they'll make some of those cylinders at the same, on the same pour, just to double check. So if anything happens, um, they can know who to blame. Then they check that concrete, and that concrete has to reach a certain amount of megapascals, certain strength. And if it doesn't, then the concrete people will be paying for the jackhammers. <laughs> also, if the concrete people know that it's being tested and they've been warned, hey, we're going to be doing test cylinders for this, that of such and such megapascals, they're going to go, oh, OK, make sure this is all good. But if it's uh, somebody's driveway, let's go, oh, yeah, just we've got some old cement yeah, down the back there somewhere. <coughs> So it's not a bad idea to uh, say, oh, yeah, we're going to do test cylinders on this. And, oh, OK, we'll give you the. Yeah, but I feel like when they do test cylinders, that's like to work out. They don't, they don't go, OK, yeah, just we'll send the batch out, take the test cylinders from the batch. I thought they work out what, the, what they need for a mix to uh, reach that level of, you know. That's, that's, right, that's right. You say, I want 30 megapascal concrete. Yeah. They, sh they know how to mix that because it's a certain percentage of concrete. Well, 75 is really high. Yeah, that's like the highest Yeah, that's like the highest performance, pretty much. Um, yeah, that, it means usually that they have to have less sand, more gravel, and more cement. So more aggregate. Yeah, and the sand will have to be cleaner, because um, the really fine sand, like clay-type sand, is what weakens it. And too much water weakens it, and not enough cement. Yeah, and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, they'd probably have to uh, slow it down as well, because it'll get, probably get too hot, because it's got so much cement. So if you want harder concrete, you have to go more cement, uh, less clay, less fine sand, and um, make sure the aggregate's hard, has to be strong enough, because the aggregate could actually be weaker than the cement sometimes. And not too much water. Too much water makes it softer. <laughs> All right. So... Um, we're testing this one out, and we're working. You notice this formula is exactly the same. Tension or compression works exactly the same. It's, it would be just like this, except the arrows are going the other way. And so we have our newtons, which is 433,000, divided by pi r squared for our diameter, and we get 24 megapascals, which is yeah, pretty standard concrete. Mind you, if that's supposed to be 25 megapascals, we just failed. It's supposed to be over that 25, not under. So that might be 20 megapascal concrete. Yeah, and standard concrete is um, between 20 and 30, be a standard one. <coughs> All right. Um, the next thing I want to mention is the uh, factor of safety. Because um, if we went back to this one and said, OK, we'll go back to our original question. We have 130 megapascals. Let's get rid of this for a sec. Let's say we're going to pick something up, and we worked out that it's going to be 130 megapascals stress in that material. Now, it's not a good idea, if you're picking up something and you're going to hang it over people's heads, to have a piece of metal there that handles exactly 130 megapascals. Why not? Why is that a bad idea? 
Right, you're right on the limit, so you don't want to be right on the limit when you're actually making something. So what you want is you want to have yourself a factor of safety. For example, if I had a factor of safety of 2, I would be choosing a material of 260 megapascals. Right now, for most lifting things, they're going to do safeties of factor factors of safety between 3 and 5. Usually a lift is about 5. So we want a material here which is much more than 130. We might be looking at 6, 700 megapascals um, to be extra safe. So a factor of safety simply is a ratio of the stress. The, working, the stress that we calculate compared to what's the ultimate stress. So if the ultimate stress was um, 260, then our factor of safety is 2. If the ultimate stress was 520, factor of safety 4. So you apply a factor of safety to stress. You could apply a factor of safety to force and just do it that way, but it's a not a good idea because some, the, the way you arrange some things, if you change the force, the stress might um, increase out of proportion. So always apply a factor of safety to the stress. <coughs> Okay, we just did compression, factor of safety again. It's too easy. Right, now, I said there's three types of stress. Tension and compression are very easy. They're just opposites of each other and they work exactly the same way. Uh, it's just that they fail differently, of course. You don't often have a failure in compression. Tension is much more important than compression. <coughs> However, shear is another common way things can fail. So some quite often things can fail in shear as well. What is shear stress? Shear, remember, is the sliding effect. So if things are going to slide this way, that's a shear. If it's just pulling, that's tension. And if it's squashing, that's compression. Back to symbols. Watch out for symbols again. According to the book, the shear stress is F with a little S on it. So we have FT for tension, FC for compression, and FS for shear. That's the book. The rest of the world has a different idea, and for shear stress, they have this symbol here, which is called tau. Looks like a curly T for um, uh, in the Greek letter. <coughs> so the rest of the world says tensile stress, compressive stress, shear stress. So they make a very strong distinction between tension compression and shear and they are actually quite different tension compression is just a pure stretch or squash of the atomic um, connections but shear is sliding them this way so it's quite different so they have a word for tension and compression they call these two axial stresses and the other one is the shear stress So if we say axial stress, we mean tension or compression. They're axial because they go in a straight line along an axis. And shear stress is sliding. So uh, where does sliding happen? Well, yeah, welds are quite often in a, in a shear stress. And bolted, bolted joints, yep. We're going to start off with a, what do we got here? Yeah, we've got a, we got a plate. We're going to punch out a, uh, a disc. <coughs> the diameter of this is 12 millimeters. And the thickness is six mil. All right, what's the area in shear? The formula is still the same. Stress equals force on area, that's always the formula. So stress, this is shear stress this time. Stress equals force over area. So what's my force? I'm told the force is, we don't know. And what's the material? Mild steel. So mild steel has a shear stress, ultimate shear stress of 360. That's that one. All the stresses have the same formula, stress equals force and area. The only thing you've got to watch is when you're doing shear stress, watch out for the area. 
So what is the area that failed when we punched out this disk? The area is not pi r squared. That would be squashing the disk. We're trying to slide the disk out from the rest of the, the metal, the rest of that plate. So the part that failed is actually this bit here. All the way around. It's like a little fence. All right, so that's the area we calculate. So when you're doing shear, watch out. Don't just do... You're so used to doing cross-sectional area, you think, oh, yeah, that's all we'll I have to do. No, in this case, we have to do the perimeter wall that slid apart, because that's the, that's the shearing. So how do I calculate the area around there? Good, so it's the circumference times the depth there. So the circumference is pi d, and the depth is your thickness, t. So that's pi times 12 times 6. All right, so 360 is my stress, using the Ivanov symbol for stress, F, S, times pi, times 12, times 6, so we end up with 81 kilonewtons. We're going to take 81 kilonewtons to punch this out. So make sure your press has got enough force to uh, press that out. Of course, they cheat a little bit too when they're punching. Quite often they'll punch so that it... Uh, rolls around. It, it may not be dead flat, it might be on a slight slope. It depends how thick the metal is. <coughs> uh, like a guillotine doesn't cut a sheet all in one go, it cuts it like scissors and that reduces your force a lot. Now in this case uh, we've got a bolted joint and the bolt is 34 millimetres diameter and the force is 13 kilonewtons. How much shear stress in the bolt? We're not necessarily breaking the bolt we just want to know how much stress in the bolt. So stress equals force and area. So force, which is 13 kilonewtons, that's our 13,000, divided by the area. Now in this case, let's have a look what it looks like. We've got our bolt, and there's... two plates. And we're pulling on those plates with 13 kilonewtons. 13 kilonewtons down, 13 kilonewtons up. How many kilonewtons all together? 13. All right, that's the definition. Once pulling, you, the definition of stress is that you have to be pulling on both ends to make stress. So, same number, we don't add them together. If you add your stresses together, add your forces, you're making a mistake. Okay, if this breaks, if the bolt breaks, where will it break? Where would the bolt break here? Straight through there. What type of failure is that? Is that tension, compression, or shear? Shear, shear. shear right, so it's sliding apart. What is the area that would slide apart? It's the bolt diameter, isn't it? So it's, it's the bolt diameter times its thickness. So it's the area is just pi r squared. Okay, in this case, we don't try to do circumference. We're just doing the cross-sectional area. Always think, what is the area that would break? Even if it's not going to break, that's the best way to imagine the area. If it was to break, what area would break? Calculate that area. All right, so it's pi r squared in this case, and uh, we end up with um, 907. 14 megapascal stress. So obviously the, bol the bolt's not going to break at 14 megapascals. The bolt should be able to handle a couple of hundred megapascals. <coughs> so, yep. why do we use washers? Yeah, put, put a washer in here. Yeah, well the two main reasons for using washers, one is so you don't damage the material surface. And there are other washers that are designed to give you certain types of friction or even locking effect so that it won't undo, like a spring washer and um, various ones with tags and things. <coughs> so it's either um, to spread out the load, stop it from skidding, you know, when you're doing the nut up, it can grip on the surface. And also uh, some of them are used for locking. All right, there's a bunch of questions in the, um, 
in the test like this, but they're really based on the, the main key about these, apart from getting the units right, you have to use newtons and millimetres to get megapascals. The main key is to think, what is the area that will fail? Calculate that area. <coughs> Looking for a factor of safety for this first one here. Um, trying to find the diameter. <coughs> so when we're trying to find diameter, we, we're really trying to find area first and then go from area back to diameter. There's that one we just uh, did over here, punching out a diameter. The, the section that breaks is the circumference around here, which is circumference times thickness. Yep, so there's only three types of stress. Tension, pulling, compression, which is squashing. They're both called axial stresses. And the other type is shear stress where they slide apart. That's it, finished. Easy one.